Hello everyone, it's Seth, probably better known as Sephron Olive, and we're back here again today with another top five cards from Ether Revolt. And today I'm joined by Chaz, and I know Chaz wants to be here today because we're gonna be talking about his favorite color in magic. So Chaz, how are you doing today? Are you excited for green cards? I'm so excited. Love green. This is this is my time. Love it. Uh yes, this is Chaz's time to shine so uh, Chaz since you love green cards so much why don't you explain to me how Aetherwind Basker is a good magic card uh, <laughs> unfortunately we start out with uh, not uh, not too enthusiastic but I'm gonna I, I don't discriminate against any green cards so I'm gonna try to spin this in a way there is going to be a time where Emrakul is not in the format anymore, so maybe, just maybe, this is a top-end Aetherworks Marvel target in a more, like, creature-based list. Like, there's a lot of ways to get energies. Like, keep that in mind. A lot of ways to get energy via creatures. So maybe to stay relevant, Aetherworks Marvel can kind of pivot itself into a more creature-based list and... You can almost kind of, in that sense, think of this as like a, uh, you know, a decimator of the provinces or a crater hoof behemoth. That this could almost like end the game on the spot, and you know, maybe maybe it goes somewhere. I don't know, <laughs> but. I mean, I guess I don't think this card is especially good. I kind of get that sense from you too, even though it's green. This isn't one of the better green cards, but it is appealing that when it attacks, you get an energy for each creature you control, which means if you have a bunch of tokens laying around or even just curve out with uh, Servant of the Conduits and Bristling Hydras and all that stuff, uh, you can potentially be gaining a massive chunk of energy when you attack. Five energy, ten energy. Uh, so so that's kind of neat that you can actually gain such a big amount of energy all at once. Plus, it can get legitimately huge. I've definitely seen decks that you play uh, a a tune with Ether on turn one, into a Servant on turn two, into Electrostatic Pummeler on turn three, Bristling Hydra on turn four. You have like 12 energy sitting around. That's not even counting the energy you get from this. If you can get in one big attack with it, you're potentially... Uh, hitting your opponent for 25, 30 trampling damage if you just pour all your energy into it. So, I mean, I don't think that'll be good enough, but it does attack for a lot of damage in the right deck list. Yeah, trying to find some upside, but uh, I'm not, unfortunately, not really too enthusiastic about the Mythic, which is kind of unfortunate, but we get to make it up with a lot of really good rares in this set. Uh, green has some really powerful rares, so let's talk about them. First off, we have oh, just a casual 3-4 for 1 mana. Green Belt Rampager, Chaz. This card is big, right? It is big. I, I can't even believe it. We get our like old-school green elephant aggressive cards back, and... I think this can enable some interesting things like with Servant of the Conduit and just this card and Paradox Engine. Like, there's some weird stuff you can do with just this card without it being like a straight up aggressive card because you can't play it turn one. Obviously, you won't have the energy. Um, and if you can manipulate the energy in a sense that it, now, if you read the card carefully, as long as you don't have the energy, you don't need to keep playing this card. So, like I said, some some interesting combo potential, but. I mean, it's already oh, uh, just a good power and toughness for its cost. So I'm really, really happy that we have like these low-costed aggressive elephants that have some other applications as well. Yeah, there are some potentially janky but pretty sweet combo tricks to do with it. As far as a beatdown card, in your opinion, being the the green master and also the aggro player, could you imagine a deck that just wants to attune with Ether on turn one, jam this on turn two as a three four, and start beating down? Is that a legitimate plan? You could do that, um, or it's almost like you can envision these energy aggressive, just kind of continuously feed energy, and then as long as you use your energy before you have to pay for this card, you can just, it's just a really great source of energy. Renewable energy, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it is a green we, we card, it. literally. <laughs> green in more on ways than one. <laughs> oh, my, oh my goodness, we are we are breaking out uh, outside of the realm of magic. <laughs> well, speaking of green cards, uh, green wheel liberator. 
Two mana, potentially a 4-3. So Wizards is really pushing the potentially big early game plays with some sort of condition to make them work. So what do you think about this one, Jazz? Yeah, I mean, this this goes back to, we've seen, like, imitations of this. Talara's Battalion, and I remember playing Standard through that time. Like, everyone loved that card, and it went nowhere. But this, I think, could have a legitimate shot. Maybe not in Standard, but you still have, like, Evolving Wilds. Maybe that works. But this seems a lot better when you have access to fetch lands. Yeah, I mean, looking at Talara's Battalion, you got to actually cast another spell, another green spell in the turn. So uh, unless you have a free green spell like Mutagenic Growth, you're not really casting that till at least turn three. With this, in Modern, with fetch lands, I mean, you basically just play it on turn two as a three, uh, four three every single game. I guess we'll have to see, uh, as weird as it sounds, I'm not 100% convinced that a... <laughs> that a 4-3 for two mana is, like, super good. Uh, but maybe that's actually good enough to be part of uh, aggressive zoo lists that are looking to just flood the board with big things early, kind of a, a backup Tarmogoyf. If you're looking to play something huge and green on turn two, this might be the second best thing to do behind a Tarmogoyf in modern. Yeah, and, and it really could edge out a Tarmogoyf. Early on, you can pressure them into kind of forcing them to block this and getting rid of their Tarmogoyf, which is just fine too. Yeah, I think I think it's as potential to see play in modern. I know also there's a, a mono green stompy deck that's a fairly popular budget choice for modern that has got some like fringe finishes here and there. Uh, it could be a part of that as well. The problem is you really want fetch lands to trigger it, and then once you're playing fetch lands are you really a budget deck anymore? So I don't know if it'll have a place there or not, but by its stats, I could see it being played in a deck that's looking to play uh, Experiment 1 into this on turn 2, into Leatherback Bayloth on turn 3, into, like, Aspect of the Hydra, give something plus 5, plus 5. That's a pretty aggressive curve, even for Modern. Yeah, it reminds me of that card in Theros. Um, I forget the card, but it was like based on devotion. Yeah, like you said, I I'm more excited about this in other formats where you're it's easier to trigger revolt than in standard uh, because it's a little harder. Yeah, in standard, it's really a little sketchy to be able to consistently trigger revolt. Although the one exception might be a green-white revolt deck featuring uh, Ether Geode Miner that we were talking about in our white section. Hey, yeah. All right, moving on, we have Rishkar P Pima Renegade. So Rishkar, the green legend from the set. Chaz, what do you think about the new elf druid? Love it. Love elves, love druids. Setin, Crozan, Seton, Crozan, Protector. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it always gets me every time. Um, always loves new additions to druid tribal. But this card is really good. I mean, just really, really good. And it plays well with some of the other cards in Aether Revolt, like the, the Winding Constrictor, I think it is, the 2-3 the snake that has, like, uh, hardened scales built into it. I mean, you can really sequence some nice plays with Rishkar. And it plays well with the Expertise, or you can just, which we'll talk about in a minute, or you can just completely ramp up into, like, a 6-mana Ajani or uh, the Gear Hulk, like, a, turn, a couple of turns early. I mean, that's just awesome. And each additional copy of Rishkar, again, it's it doesn't matter if it's legendary because you get the Enter the Battlefield ability and you don't really need to worry about keeping both of them. So, again, it's not bad to play in multiples. Uh, it really can push some aggressive plays early on and then ramp into some really great stuff uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, in the right build, this can almost be like a Cryptolith right? So when you have a city on the battlefield. Like, you just uh, use Oath of Ajani, uh, Verterous Gearhulk, stuff like that to spread the counters around. Obviously, Rishkar himself. So you spread the counters around, and all of your creatures are just going to be able to tap for mana, which is potentially really powerful. If you go one drop, two drop into this, you're going to have two mana dorks the following turn, which puts you up to Gearhulk range and a Johnny range, and to do some really crazy things. So I can imagine that this is the card that could let green beat downy type decks actually maybe be fast enough to compete with the turn four, turn five Emrakul type decks. This, it seems like it has a lot of potential there. Yeah, and just keep in mind, so it, all it reads, 
you only it only needs plus one plus one counters from every anywhere. So if you oath of Ajani a bunch of creatures, they now they're now all able to produce mana. So again, just keep that in mind. And yeah, Rishkar, you're right. Maybe it, it has the chance to kind of combat that early turn Aetherworks Marvel because it can really get out of hand pretty quickly. Or it's just a, four, it's a three mana four four. <laughs> or you can put the counters on an early Grim Flare to get uh, Grim Flare triggers. I mean, it has a lot of applications. Yeah, there's a, a lot of powerful things you can potentially do with the card. So I, I think it's a pretty sweet one. All the Legendary Cycle from this set, they all are pretty good. I've been impressed with yeah, all of them. Yeah, they really are. I have been as well. You're right. Well, like the other legends, Riskar is also an expert, and his expertise is the most expensive of the bunch, but also has some appealing text, letting you draw a bunch of cards. It's, it's expensive, but it's worth it, because we're doing exactly what you love. Other than taking turns, it's drawing cards, and you can potentially draw a lot of them. So even if Rishkar is the only creature, I mean, this you can play it basically after Rishkar if you have a couple creatures on the battlefield, and now you're talking about paying six and ramping into it for drawing three cards and dropping a free gear hole. I mean, or, so that just seems awesome to me. And another part of this, I'm pretty sure that you draw the cards first, so you actually can draw the cards and then play one of the cards you just drew with as your free card, which is pretty sweet as well. Yep, uh, you can drop Ishkana, you can drop a lot of great stuff at the five slot in green, and... Um, you know, maybe this this obviously doesn't feel like a four uh, four of in your deck list because it is six. You don't really want this all the time, but I think it's a really good like one or two of to keep yourself in the game. And like I said, you can draw a lot of cards and get something really great for free. I think it's the highest of all the expertise in terms of the converted mana cost that you can play for free. Uh, it is the highest of the converted mana cost. That's very true, and that puts it up in the range of pretty much uh, almost all the Planeswalkers, a lot of powerful creatures, the Skanas, Gearhawks, like you mentioned. And what I really want to do with this card is just have an Emrakul on the battlefield and draw 13. That sounds pretty oh, awesome. That'd be great. <laughs> I don't know what you would need 13 cards for after an Emrakul, but... If you ever did need it, it is there, you're right. <laughs> uh, so that brings us to the end of our top five green cards from E3 Volt. So Chaz, Green Mage, what's your favorite of the bunch? Oh, it went by so fast. But there's there's just great value in green. I mean, I love Rishkar. I think Rishkar is awesome. I don't really think it's uh, – there's no close second. I think Rishkar can do some really interesting stuff in Standard. Um, we'll see if it can edge out the stuff that is going on currently, but I think it has a place for sure. I'm going to go with Green Wheel Liberator just because I really like the idea of dropping that on turn two in Modern. I don't know if it'll work in Standard. I don't even know if it'll really work in Modern, but a two mana 4-3 just feels like a powerful card, and all the Revolt cards are just so easy to trigger in Modern thanks to fetch land. so I'm hoping that maybe it's good enough to see some play in older formats because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Good card. Anyway, that's been our top five green cards from E3 Volt. Thank you very much for watching, and big thanks to you, Chaz, for taking the time to hang out and talk about your favorite color in Magic. Awesome. I'm always up for that. Can't, I, I just, I love green. Everyone <laughs> knows that. Uh, take the opportunity. It's been fun, Seth. Uh, everyone, thanks for joining us, and hopefully you love the green cards in Aether Revolt.